FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's February 27th, 2018. Where did the month go? I'm not sure, but we sure did see increased volatility. We saw a gold price stuck in the mud, and a lot more is stuck in the mud as well. But one person who never is... Craig Hempke, a.k.a. Turd Ferguson of tfmetalsreport.com. Craig, welcome back. Kerry, it's always a pleasure to hear your soothing tones. <laughs> soothing. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I know some people that will take issue with that, but uh, a lot of them comment on YouTube as well. So you take it for what it's worth. But uh, Well, you, you've got the voice for, made for radio, but you've got the face made for radio, too. That's the Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly my sentiments. <laughs> so so uh, what's, uh, what's going on with these insane markets? I mean, just when you think uh, the stock markets... Uh, ascent was over and done with it comes roaring back yeah we can start there it you know it was uh, almost going up at a straight 45 degree angle across the chart from that period kind of november through the end of january I mean, it was it, it had gotten some of the momentum uh, indices that people follow rsis monthly rsis all that kind of stuff had gotten to extreme levels historic levels overbought and so the correction uh, I guess in hindsight is always pretty clear. You could have seen it coming. Um, and, and also, you know, it, I think a lot of that was due to the HFT that infect every market now mm. in that, you know, the HFT providers, the HFT companies all talk about how, you know, they provide liquidity, they provide a real service. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, up until the moment they pull all their bids. Until you need, but, you know, until you really need it. They give all the liquidity the market needs until it's really needed and then they're nowhere to be found because they've covered all of their bets and they're out. Right. It, I, I always compare it to the Platte River where I grew up uh, out in central Nebraska. If anybody's ever driven across Nebraska, well, I'm sorry yeah, uh, that you have to. Corn. Sometimes you have to. And if you ever get out in central Nebraska, it's flat as a pancake. And the Platte River is flat as well. It's about a mile wide, but it's about six inches deep. Right. And that actually is what the, or our HFT markets are. Uh, the depth and liquidity is a mile wide and about six inches deep. We've seen it happen a couple of times. The most recent one that you could compare what we just went through, uh, the most recent period was back in August of 2015, where the market was uh, went down all through a week, closed week on Friday, and then on Monday, they could barely even get it open. You might recall, I think it was the 24th of August, 2015. Uh, every, a whole bunch of ETFs and individual issues couldn't even open because they were more than the 5% limit down where they get halted. And we opened something like down a thousand and then magically uh, things got better. That's kind of what this last issue was like. I think the most telling sign, and this is what I was telling people on my site, was uh, the action around a couple of the key moving averages. When it when the S&P broke below the 50 day, uh, right after the Super Bowl, when it happened on that uh, Monday, it tried to get back above it on Tuesday. And when that failed, it almost seemed inevitable that it was going to fall toward the 200 day, which is exactly where it magically reversed a couple days later. Spent all of last week trying to get back above the 50 day. And once it did, uh, it's been off to the races. You know, Kerry, I think uh, it would not surprise me at all if the S&P didn't at least get back up to where it was in late January. But it also wouldn't surprise me if it didn't keep going. I don't think we are in a, a Weimar Republic, you know, a Venezuelan style hyperinflation yet. Yet. <laughs> But we are in, I, I think the case could be made now finally in 2018 that we're moving toward kind of the pseudo hyperinflation that we were all talking about back in 2009 and 10. And if that's the case, why wouldn't the stock market go to, you know, 30,000 and beyond uh, as all of these trillions of dollars that have been created by the central banks kind of come out of uh, quarantine, the velocity of money gradually starts to pick up, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, wrapping up on the stock market, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we didn't just now that that's behind us, just like once it got behind us in 2015, we just kept going higher. It wouldn't surprise me. We've kept going higher now, too. Yeah, what about rising interest rates here? That kind of feeds into the higher inflation meme because you know once the rates go up the banks start lending because it's profitable for them to lend right well and okay so here's your conundrum uh whether or not all of this can hold together 
because you and I have discussed and all, I mean, but obviously not just you and I, people have worried about this now for years, that this uh, a bubble, if you will, in, in treasury bonds, that the central banks just kept blowing larger and larger by driving the, pr- the prices of bonds up and yields down. And encouraging uh, institutions, whether they be hedge funds or pension funds or whatever, just to keep buying them and actually keep leveraging them because you can buy a million dollars worth of treasuries and put them up at margin and you get 90 percent of your money back to go buy other stuff. Yeah. Well, OK, if your if your original purchase of those treasuries was, say, in the 10 year note variety and you bought a lot of those between one and a half and two and a half percent over the last couple of years. Well, now the 10 year notes at three or maybe it goes to three and a half. Your value of those bonds is falling. It, depending on how close they are to maturity, it's going to depend on that's how far they'll fall. But nonetheless, they're falling and it creates a margin call, right? Because the value of your underlying collateral has fallen. So now that, you know, you get this margin call and you start selling stuff to meet your margin call. That's kind of what facilitated the decline a couple of weeks ago. So you don't know how much further interest rates can go up without devaluing the existing bonds to the point where it creates liquidity issues. The other thing to uh, carry that is going to be a real problem and nobody's talking about this. Yes, a few people are, but at my site, we've been talking about it for years is the debt service. Uh, The U S has managed to service its accumulated debt over the last five or six years and keep it you know, that line item on the budget near $350 billion or $400 billion, even as the debt has grown, they've been able to keep that debt service uh, kind of stagnant because interest rates have been pushed lower and lower. And they've moved a lot of that debt shorter and shorter on the curve to, to maximize uh, or I guess minimize the interest expense, uh, maximize their uh, possible, I guess, exposure to that. Well, now, you know, the, we were already set to have the highest net issuance of treasuries in 2018 that we'd had since 2010. Yeah. It's going to be like 1.3 trillion. And with Trump's new budget plan, it's probably going to be more than that. And it's going to be more than that for the next five years to come. So where's that money going to come from? Who are going to be the buyers of treasuries uh, that will you know, create enough buying to keep interest rates low? And if they don't show up. And if the central banks don't go back to buying these things, then interest rates go up to four or 5%. Okay, fine. Uh, one thing, again, no one's talking about is the debt service on that accumulated debt. If it's 400 billion now at an average, you know, maturity of four years and an average interest rate of, you know, two and a half or 3%, well, it's going to be 600 billion. It's going to be 800 billion as rates go up. So not only do rates go up, cause all of this liquidity issue. Not only rates go up and squeeze a consumer and and crush mortgage issuance and new home buying and credit cards and all this kind of stuff, rates also go up and it affects the debt service of the U.S. and it's going to force the U.S. to need more cash. And this whole thing begins to spiral that much more quicker. So anyway, putting it all together, you know, we had this crazy little period here this month. And I think a lot of folks are are just kind of, they're just so exasperated after five years of watching gold go down that they're about ready to give up. And I think that's, that's the time. <laughs> absolutely the wrong time to give up. All right. Speaking of giving up gold, a number of people who we all know and love have uh, just given it up and gone into Bitcoin. And we saw Bitcoin, the same type of chart formation, only steeper. It was more going up at a 180 degree level, 180 yeah. degree line and crashed went down to like under 6,000. Now it's back. It bounced up 11 and a half. Now I didn't look at it today, honestly, because there's really no point. 10 and change, 10 something. And it kind of corresponded perfectly with the stock market collapse for a, uh, an asset that's supposed to be uncorrelated to anything here. Craig, what do you make of that? Yeah, that, I don't know. That might be kind of coincidence. Um, it also might be coincidence that the collapse began as soon as the CME started trading Bitcoin futures. I mean, the very day. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I might put a little more stock in that. Um, you know, and I have a theory there. If if you want to talk Bitcoin for a second, a lot of sure. folks say, "Well, how could the banks be manipulating uh, Bitcoin the way very they manipulate easily. gold?" Easily. And that, <laughs> what's that? I said very easily. In fact, well, yeah. easier than gold. And, and people say it, it is easier in gold because people think that the process has to be the same. Uh, and it's in fact, it's the exact opposite. In gold, the manipulation uh, was eloquently put by my buddy Ned Naylor Leyland years sure. ago when he said it's the 
the future's tail wags the spot dog and the banks manipulate the futures so that the spot price uh, is manageable and then they manage the physical flow through that. In Bitcoin, it's the opposite. Uh, It is the spot Bitcoin that wags the futures. And so uh, my theory in all of this is that that last run up in Bitcoin, where it really did go parabolic, I mean, you've got this fixed supply of Bitcoin at any given time. And I think the banks, in anticipation of these futures and in making a market and all that stuff, they were the last buyers. They were the ones. It was their buying that drove it from 8000 to 10000 to 20000 Now, once they amassed this war chest, now, because the price of Bitcoin is so easily moved by buying or selling relatively large amounts of Bitcoin, I think the bank trading desk can profit by working the process in reverse. They take a position in the futures, either long or short, and then they buy and sell the actual Bitcoin, which then drives the futures and they make profit by trading the futures that way. It's a perfect arbitrage. It's perfect in so many ways because they're shallow markets. At its peak, there were only 408,000 or almost 500,000 Bitcoin transactions a day. Now there's less than half that. If you sell 500 coins into the market, you are going to drop that price and then you buy a future immediately on the drop, it's going to respond. It's going to go back almost Bef- immediately. Or, or, you, or you sell a future before yeah. you sell the Bitcoin. Exactly. You, you know you're going to affect the price. And look, I went to the North American Bitcoin conference and I found out there is a social media website for alt currency traders. And there are groups on there that plan pump and dumps in all of these cryptocurrencies at different times of the day and night. And they all just pile in and pile out. They drive it up, they drive it down. And this is rampant in the space here because there's no global regulator of cryptocurrencies. The only way to effectively regulate them is to have a global regulator, but nobody trusts anybody enough. Unless you're going to use the IMF to do it, I don't see how it's going to happen. Right. And does anybody really want that at the end of the day either? But you look at what happened back on December the 18th. Somebody had to be the seller for all of the buyers uh, initially of the Bitcoin futures contracts. You know, and, and as a market maker, that's what the banks always do in the gold and silver futures and everything else. So think of it, they've accumulated all these Bitcoin in the month of December and maybe November. And then right at the peak, they have all of a sudden got a short position, let's say, in the futures. So, hey, let's dump, you know, a thousand lots of our accumulated Bitcoin and smash the price down to 12,000. And yippee, look at all the money we made in the futures. Then once it gets down to six, you start, you know, you've eliminated half your position maybe on the way down. Now you buy long the futures. And then go buy a bunch of Bitcoin back and up the price goes back up to 11,000. You make money again then. Again, it's the same idea. It's just a different process. Instead of selling and manipulating the futures to affect spot, you would sell and manipulate the spot to affect the futures. It's the same thing. And it's it's easier in that because you got nobody yeah. looking over your shoulder. You right. can, right. you can uh, have another person do the selling and you do the buying or vice versa. You can have right. whole groups of of raiders hitting it at once and you think oh well it'll work itself out but you know what also the one other thing craig is there's poor information in the bitcoin market you would think it's digital market the information's perfect wrong why else does every exchange have a different price why is the cash price the peer-to-peer price much higher than the exchange price so when you've When you've got a trading platform, I'm talking about one that just like they use in the markets, just like the HFT traders use, when you've got that platform for the alt currencies, you can manipulate at, uh, and you can arbitrage, take advantage of those divergencies instantly. And I understand why people are giving up, uh, you know, stock trading and, and, currency fx trading why they're going into bitcoin because if you've got the trading platform which the pros do we heard people at that conference i mentioned before talk about trading platforms that they were going to market to the public you got that trading platform it's a license to print money yeah that's right so getting back to what originally shot us down this tangent uh is bitcoin trading with the stock market or is bitcoin doing what it's been doing since december the 18th now for the last 60 days 
uh, because the banks are suddenly involved. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's definitely a part of it. And yeah. I think we're going to know more. The, the, look, uh, the, also the media turned on Bitcoin big time. Up until that point, they patronized it. It was a an oddity, uh, a phenomena to be, uh, you know, kind of not taken seriously. All of a sudden, end of December, New York Times starts publishing negative articles about Bitcoin. And there's a whole series of them. And papers come out saying how it's manipulated. And all of a sudden, the price starts to like get slammed. It was all part of an orchestrated thing. Is this the point where the government realizes, hey, these cryptocurrencies really could be a threat to our monopoly? I'm not willing to go that far because we have no evidence. But it certainly is interesting that the press for cryptos changed on a dime where it was like, oh, you know, these uh, millennial multimillionaires, billionaires walking around buying up yachts to all of a sudden uh, the market's being manipulated. Like if they only paid that much attention to the so-called mainstream medias, we'd know a lot more than we do now. Yeah, no doubt. But it doesn't, it, at the end of the day, uh, I, I'm confident that Bitcoin's acceptance will only continue to grow, you know, things like Litecoin too. And, and they really yeah. are. You know, I know a lot of folks uh, that I associate with, you know, we'll loosely call ourselves gold bugs for lack of a, a better term. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are resistant to change and are unwilling to see Bitcoin for what it is, which is really a complement to your existing physical gold and silver holdings because they accomplish the same thing. Yeah. You know, it's it's money. It is money outside of the banking system. It's money that is not constantly being devalued and printed by the central banks for their own ends. Uh, and so there's no reason to fear one or dislike one versus the other. I mean, I think they're complementary assets. And I, in the end, they're both going higher. You know, we, we, we began this by talking about uh, gold and, and the markets and the interest rates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I just wrote a piece this morning that uh, will probably get published this afternoon about the gold price versus the accumulated U.S. debt and how it was tracking it really from the middle 1990s all the way on through 2011, then suddenly diverged in 2012. Uh, if you plot it, uh, you've got the accumulated debt going up at almost just a straight 45 degree angle. And in 2011, gold got well above that line. And then by 2015, it had swung almost the exact same amount below that line. So the line, the accumulated debt, it almost acts as like a median line for the range. Uh, we're now moving higher again. And I just, I'm totally confident that in the months and years ahead, and I'm talking this year and next, and even beyond, as the U.S. fiscal situation just deteriorates rapidly, again, with these budgets that are a trillion dollars as far as the eye can see, and with the, how that's going to impact interest rates and the, how that's going to rattle the markets, the gold prices at least move back to that median line, which, you know, on that chart would put it today back up toward 18, 1900. And if it gets crazy again, again, then this goes without, you know, physical price resets and Chinese doing whatever they do, you know, and everything else that we talk about. We're easily back above 2000 uh, in the next two, three, four years. You know, if there's another financial crisis or anything else calam you know, calamitous that comes along. So anyway, the two of them fit perfectly together. I'm sure both uh, Bitcoin will rally again past its highs Absolutely. that we saw a couple of months ago and, and gold will go up past its highs that we saw a couple of years ago. Totally agree with you there. I don't think there's any question that's going to happen. Hey, looking at uh, some of the other markets that you follow, what are you seeing? Well, a lot of the short term stuff hinges upon interest rates and the dollar. Uh, we were about alone this time a year ago talking about the dollar going down. If you remember right after the election of Trump, it was king dollar. Right. You know, the dollar index was going to 110, 120. And so it went down 10 percent last year from 103 to 93. And now already this year, we've been down as low as 88, 89. We're back up to a little over 90, push 91 today. So we're still down a couple percent year to date. I think that trend continues, Carrie. I don't think there's any way uh, the U.S. I, well, first, I think it's a U.S. policy. I think Trump wants a weaker dollar. I think the Fed wants a weaker dollar. They're trying to spark exports. They're trying to spark inflation. So I think that continues, at least gradually. Uh, at times, it will get a little out of hand like it did a couple of weeks ago. That will eventually prompt uh, interest in the commodity sector as a whole, but then specifically gold, silver, and the mining shares. As 
the global interest starts to pivot that direction out of overvalued sectors like stocks and bonds into undervalued sectors like commodities and specifically the mining shares. I think that flow of funds starts gradually as we go through the year, but then it begins to ramp up considerably later this year and next. And I have likened where we are in 2018 to where we were in 2010. Mm-hmm. And back then, silver was between 16 and 18, just like it is now. And gold was around 1300, like it is now. And, and the Fed had done QE1, but that was going to be it. Yeah, and there were green shoots thought. in the economy and everything was wonderful. Well, by November of 2010, QE2 was announced. And that's when silver went from 18 to 48 and gold went from 1300 to 1900. And I, I see a similar thing playing out. You know, they could talk all they want about rate hikes. They could talk all about, about you know, tightening and all this kind of jazz. But as the economy doesn't grow and as inflation doesn't pick up and god forbid stock market actually rolls over you know we could just as easily be talking about more qe and uh, cutting rates by later this year instead of hiking them and a year could play out just like it did in 2010 and next year could play out just uh, like it did in 2011. so that's kind of where i think we are now yeah i think uh, you could very well be right uh you know it's interesting this whole concept of no volatility in the market has been shot to hell in the first, you know, the first uh, quarter, actually yeah. the second month. I think we're in for a lot of volatility this year. I think it's going to be one of those buckle your seatbelt kind of years. We might very well finish off ahead of where we left off, especially if if rates don't go up as much as they're anticipating that they go up. These so-called experts who never saw inflation heating up, by the way, Craig, you know, inflation was just going to stay under control for the rest of the century. Probably you and I would be gone by the time it went above 2%, right? Right. Right. Well, and, and if you look at what we just discussed in terms of interest rates, in terms of the dollar, uh, and, and, and volatility and everything else you just mentioned, just think again, two of the three overarching themes that are always out there on a daily basis, you know, the political risk, you know, what's, how's this going to play out with Trump and how the midterm election is going to go and everything else as we go later on this year, the geopolitical risk. I mean, this North Korean issue isn't certainly getting any better and everything else that's going on around the world from Syria to Ukraine and elsewhere, but then also the de-dollarization risk that's out there too. You know, the, the Chinese finally, it appears are going to begin trading that yuan denominated crude oil contract uh, in about a month, March 26th. You see the Chinese, the Russians, all these other countries continue to add to their gold reserves. You got uh, all these other things that are going on that are always there. Like I said, in the end, uh, I don't think it means that, uh, that even though we have frustrating days like today, I don't think gold prices and silver prices are going to like go crashing to new lows or something below where they bottomed out in 2015. Instead, the pendulum swings back the other way, like we discussed. And uh, this is not the time to be given up. This is the time to be uh, preparing for this next stage. Couldn't agree with you more. That means uh stack while the stacking is good, right? While the prices are reasonable and you can still do it at an affordable rate, you know, just do it slowly. Always advocated to building positions over time. So you either average up or you average down. In fact, if you did it in the past year, you average sideways pretty much. I mean, if you took it at the average price of gold over the past year, you were like right in that like 1310 rate, I think, right around there, that price. Uh, yeah. If you were buying every month. So, right, right. You know, this is right. inevitable. If, What's going to happen you, is inevitable. You're right. And if you've understood that it was inevitable and you took a long term picture and, and kind of took all this in stride, as frustrating as it's been over the last five years, then you've continued to average in and you bought all the, you know, I've got silver, I bought it $14. Two and a half years ago. Yeah. And as long as you were doing that, you're not just sitting here with your, you know, flag in the ground going, oh, I got screwed because I bought it at 35. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I bought it at 35 too. I bought some at 45, but I also bought a whole bunch at 15. Mm-hmm. And so my average cost is now under 20. Yep. And I don't, so I'm not complaining. I mean, yeah, I guess there's an opportunity cost that I could have been doing other things with it, but the system could have broken on any given day as well. You had your insurance so, just because your right. house didn't burn down last week. Didn't mean that you canceled your, your homeowner's policy right. on Monday. Say, Hey, it didn't burn down. I mean, there's an right. inevitability about this thing. Maybe it won't result in total collapse. Maybe they'll be able to figure something out, but there's going to be a period of chaos or 
great instability and there's going to be a time where the system has to change it can't go on the way it is you know just like it's just like the guy who in in 2008 refinanced got just got done on refinancing his house for the fifth time uh you know basically hocked the living room and the kitchen and everything else all the cars are financed everything else had you know maybe 30 days worth of expenses in the bank and then it crashed and for that person that was a reset right whether they had to go bankrupt or just mm -hmm. walk away strategic default from the house didn't matter by the way i just want to share with you one story about that i have a friend in california who has not made a mortgage payment for over nine years in the la area and every month <laughs> every month the bank threatens that they're going to foreclose you know cali is a non-judicial state which means all you got to do is declare it in default you can sue you can sir, sell it off at the courthouse steps in 30 days every month they threaten to foreclose and every month they postpone it and which obviously shows me there is something really screwed up with that file but it's one yeah. of the longest ones around that i know of you know there's a few in florida that go over a decade but in a non-judicial state i've not heard of such a thing and yet you know i call her every month to check in and see what's going on with her and every month she's like i'm still here <laughs> live wow. to fight another month <laughs> you're right she's got him over a barrel because the, all of that remember all the mers yeah, and uh, exactly. that database and everything that they they've sold and resold and and fraudulently re-signed that you mortgage probably it. so many times that the last thing they want to do is take it to court yeah well they you know they could if they they know if they try to sell it she's going to go to court all right what will happen there well they've pretty much stacked the deck against the homeowners but there are certain instances where they will not not to uh, decide for the bank and this is probably one of them and they know it just as just as a, a an oddity and interesting uh little phenomena that took place so hey craig tell us about your site uh, why should why you should be going there hey we've been fighting this fight now for almost eight years Gary, and we're not going to go anywhere the site is populated with people that they've been fighting it too and we're all here to see each other through it to the end so we keep uh, accumulating some bitcoin we keep stacking physical gold and physical silver knowing again as you said this is all still inevitable uh, despite the day-to-day -day ups and downs so uh, if it's something that you feel like you're in the same boat, I invite you to join us. It's uh, tfmetalsreport.com. All right. Definitely go there. It's well worth your while. I'm a regular there myself. Hey, questions, comments, be part of the show. Uh, just email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. The Twitter feeds at Kerry Lutz, the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Hey, Craig, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. And we will talk to you again real soon. Thanks, Kerry. It's always fun to talk. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's February 27th, 2018. Where did the month go? I'm not sure, but we sure did see increased volatility. We saw a gold price stuck in the mud, and a lot more is stuck in the mud as well. But one person who never is, Craig Hempke, a.k.a. Turd Ferguson of tfmetalsreport.com. Craig, welcome back. Kerry, it's always a pleasure to hear your soothing tones. <laughs> soothing, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> I know some people that will take issue with that, but uh, a lot of them comment on YouTube as well, so you take it for what it's worth. But uh, Well, you, you've got the voice for, made for radio, but you've got the face made for radio, too. That's Yeah, the exactly, exactly my sentiments. <laughs> so so uh, what's, uh, what's going on with these insane markets? I mean, just when you think uh, the stock market's... Uh, 
ascent was over and done with, it comes roaring back. Yeah, we could start there. It, you know, it was uh, almost going up at a straight 45 degree angle across the chart from that period, kind of November through the end of January. I mean, it was, it, it had gotten some of the momentum uh, indices that people follow, RSIs, monthly RSIs, all that kind of stuff. It got into extreme levels, historic levels overbought. And so the correction, uh, I guess, in hindsight, is always pretty clear. You can wear it magically reversed a couple of days later. Spent all of last week trying to get back above the 50 day. And once it did, uh, it's been off to the races. You know, Kerry, I think uh, it would not surprise me at all if the S&P didn't at least get back up to where it was in late January. But it also wouldn't surprise me if it didn't keep going. I don't think we are in a, a Weimar Republic you know, a Venezuelan style hyperinflation yet. Yet. <laughs> but we are in, I, I think the case could be made now finally in 2018 that we're moving toward kind of the pseudo hyperinflation that we were all talking about back in 2009 and 10. And if that's the case, why wouldn't the stock market go to, you know, 30,000 and beyond uh, as all of these trillions of dollars that have been created by the central banks kind of come out of uh, quarantine, the velocity of money gradually starts to pick up, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, wrapping up on the stock market, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we didn't just now that that's behind us, just like once it got behind us in 2015, we just kept going higher. It wouldn't surprise me we kept going higher now too. Yeah, what about rising interest rates here? That kind of feeds into the higher inflation meme because you know once the rates go up the banks start lending because it's profitable for them to lend right well and okay so here's your conundrum uh whether or not all of this can hold together because you and i have discussed and all i mean but obviously not just you and i people have worried about this now for years that this uh a bubble if you will in in treasury bonds that the central banks just kept blowing larger and larger by driving the, pr the prices of bonds up and yields down and encouraging uh, institutions, whether there be hedge funds or pension funds or whatever, just to keep buying them and actually keep leverage to have seen it coming. Um, and, and also, you know, it, I think a lot of that was due to the HFT that infect every market now in that, you know, the HFT providers, the HFT companies all talk about how, you know, they provide liquidity, they provide a real service. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. uh, up until the moment they pull all their bids. Until you need, but, you know, until you really need it. They give all the liquidity the market needs until it's really needed. And then they're nowhere to be found because they've covered all of their bets and they're out. Right. It, I, I always compare it to the Platte River where I grew up uh, out in central Nebraska. If anybody's ever driven across Nebraska, well, I'm sorry yeah. uh, that you have to. Corn. Sometimes you have to. And if you ever get out in central Nebraska, it's flat as a pancake. And the Platte River is flat as well. It's about a mile wide, but it's about six inches deep. Right. And that actually is what the, our HFT markets are. Uh, the depth and liquidity is a mile wide, and about six inches deep. We've seen it happen a couple of times. The most recent one that you could compare what we just went through, uh, the most recent period was back in August of 2015, where the market was uh, went down all through a week, closed week on Friday, and then on Monday, they could barely even get it open. You might recall, I think it was the 24th of August, 2015. Uh, every, a whole bunch of ETFs and individual issues couldn't even open because they were more than the 5% limit down where they get halted. And we opened something like down a thousand and then magically uh, things got better. That's kind of what this last issue was like. I think the most telling sign, and this is what I was telling people on my site, was uh, the action around a couple of the key moving averages. When it when the S&P broke below the 50 day, uh, right after the Super Bowl, when it happened uh, on that uh, Monday, it tried to get back above it on Tuesday. And when that failed, it almost seemed inevitable that it was going to fall toward the 200 day, which is exactly them because you can buy a million dollars worth of treasuries and put them up at margin and you get 90% of your money back to go buy other stuff. Yeah. Well, okay. If your, if your original purchase of those treasuries was say in the 10 year note variety, and you bought a lot of those between one and a half and two and a half percent over the last couple of years. Well, now the 10 year notes at three, or maybe it goes to three and a half. Your value of those bonds is falling. Okay. Depending on how close they are to maturity, it's going to depend on that's how far they'll fall. But nonetheless, they're falling and it creates a margin call, right? Because the value of your underlying collateral has fallen. So now, you know, you get this margin call and you start selling stuff to meet your margin call. That's kind of what 
facilitated the decline a couple of weeks ago. So you don't know how much further interest rates can go up without devaluing the existing bonds to the point where it creates liquidity issues. The other thing, uh, Carrie, that is going to be a real problem, and nobody's talking about this. Yes, a few people are, but at my site, we've been talking about it for years, is the debt service. Uh, The U.S. has managed to service its accumulated debt over the last five or six years and keep it you know, that line item on the budget near $350 billion or $400 billion, even as the debt has grown, they've been able to keep that debt service uh, kind of stagnant because interest rates have been pushed lower and lower, and they've moved a lot of that debt shorter and shorter on the curve to, to maximize uh, or, I guess, minimize the interest expense, uh, maximize their uh, possible, I guess, exposure to that. Well, now, you know, the, we were already set to have the highest net issuance of treasuries in 2018 that we'd had since 2010. Yeah. It's going to be like 1.3 trillion. And with Trump's new budget plan, it's probably going to be more than that. And it's going to be more than that for the next five years to come. So where's that money going to come from? Who are going to be the buyers of treasuries uh, that will you know, create enough buying to keep interest rates low? And if they don't show up, and if the central banks don't go back to buying these things, then interest rates go up to four or 5%. Okay, fine. Uh, one thing, again, no one's talking about is the debt service on that accumulated debt. If it's $400 billion now at an average you know, maturity of four years and an average interest rate of you know, two and a half or three percent, well, it's going to be $600 billion. It's going to be $800 billion as rates go up. So not only do rates go up, cause all of this liquidity issue, not only rates go up and squeeze a consumer and, and crush mortgage issuance and new home buying and credit cards and all this kind of stuff, rates also go up and it affects the debt service of the U.S. and it's going to force the U.S. to need more cash. And this whole thing begins to spiral that much more quicker. So anyway, putting it all together, I, you know, we had this crazy little period here this month. And I think a lot of folks are are just kind of, they're just so exasperated after five years of watching gold go down that they're about ready to give up. And I think that's, that's the time. <laughs> absolutely the wrong time to give up. All right. Speaking of giving up gold, a number of people who we all know and love have uh, just given it up and gone into Bitcoin. And we saw Bitcoin, the same type of chart formation, only steeper. It was more going up at a 180 degree level, 180 yeah. degree line and crashed went down to like under 6,000. Now it's back. It bounced up 11 and a half. Now I didn't look at it today, honestly, because there's really no point. 10 and change, 10 something. 